Philly Lutaya became the first prominent African to publicly declare he had AIDS. AIDS is here, but people wanted always to ignore it and uh, pretend as if it was not here. So I wanted to go on shouting loud about this crisis. I, I ignored people who, are, who were calling me a liar, people who were calling me an opportunist. I knew time would come when they would understand. four decades now since the first cases of HIV AIDS were discovered here in Uganda. Uh, the first case was way back in 1982 on the shores of Lake Victoria. Among those groups of uh, lake traders, they would uh, pick goods from Rakai on this side and take them to Vukoba on the Tanzanian side. The disease started moving inwards on the busy traffic roads, the, the massacre road through Kampala, through now eastern Uganda. And then from those busy traffic routes, the Trans-African Highway, it moved into the major towns. Right through, actually, because this was also being found, reported in other countries, in, other, in, the, in Kenya, in Mombasa, and Nairobi. Then from the major towns, it moved into the rest of the rural Uganda. I first heard about this disease, actually back in 1984, and it was called gay-related immunodeficiency virus. But we didn't know it was the disease that was described first in California. Then later on, we just, uh, think somebody, a doctor who was working in Rakai, this, they described this disease, slim disease, people slim up, yeah, and then and, and eventually die. Literally, I know that actually I myself had got infected with this disease. If you had a diagnosis, of HIV, it was almost a death sentence. And you know, there was a drum, almost every activity, all families were impacted. Somebody knew at least someone having HIV who had died of AIDS. So you are either infected or, or, or affected. The leadership of President Museveni was very instrumental. The first thing he did was to put in place a National HIV Prevention Committee and the AIDS Control Program in the Ministry of Health in 1986. This is the earliest program, the one of the Ministry of Health in the Sub-Saharan region. Our only weapon as a country was uh, prevention, the ABC, abstinence, uh, you know, for those who are not yet sexually active, being faithful for those with sexual partners to your sexual partner, and then use of condoms if you either you were unsure of the status of your partner. Fortunately, we began to have breakthroughs in science. Uh, we got uh, now, for instance, more uh, and better testing capacity and testing became more common in the country, HIV testing services. I developed some signs of what we know now as early uh, uh, HIV infection, swelling of the lymph nodes, skin rashes. And in 88, I developed herpes and I, around the same time I developed TB. But again, I didn't know I had the HIV until I tested myself in 93. ARVs, the triple therapy, at that time we were calling it HART, highly active antiretroviral treatment, became available as an option. It was very expensive, but at least it began to trickle down slowly in countries. I myself started swallowing ARVs around in 2000, 2000, but I didn't do so well. Until 2003, when I started getting uh, PEPFA drugs, so that's when my imp I started improving. Today I have come to stand before you as a living example of an AIDS victim. This is serious. I never wanted this to happen to me. So, straightforward, I would like to tell you that I would not like this to happen to you, to any of you.
the message I would like to give to you is that let us do our best to have a virus-free young generation. At the end of 2020, we had 38,000 new HIV infections. The numbers have been dropping. They have dropped from about 62,000 in 2015. AIDS deaths have come down from about 50,000 to 21,000 in 2020. Big improvements. But we are still seeing that we have a disproportionate number of these new infections occurring in young people. 41% of those 38,000 infections occurred between the age group 15 and 24 years. Those infections were three times more among girls compared to among boys. I was born with HIV. I'm with my twin sister. And um, it hasn't been easy. From the time we found out that we're living with HIV, uh, we're disclosed to by our mom, and um, life changed, I should say, a bit. You could hear, you know, people speaking about um, HIV, how it is, uh, how it kills. We used to have rumors from our neighbors that um, that family is family of people living with HIV. Actually, they would call us people with AIDS. So, anytime we had someone, maybe we lost a, a loved one, they would always like affirm or confirm that maybe it was. HIV that killed them. You know, the earlier information was given more into shock and awe, people into submission. But uh, this didn't seem to do a lot because uh, deploying this as a, a disease which is going to kill you. People don't want to think about death, especially when they are young. My sister got sick and they found out about the medication she was taking. So this nurse she was around children, the students, and then she says, even this medication for HIV people. And of course, rumors spread like a wildfire, so everybody got to know about it. They would be asking me so many questions. Why are you taking, why are you taking these medications every day? So I would keep on telling them I have a heart problem, I have this, I have that. Then afterwards, I would be like, I think sickle cell would do better. So I kind of like studied about sickle cell, and they were like, you'd be on medication the whole time. So I was like, you know what? I have sickle cell. <laughs> That is how like, I kind of like, you know, um, stopped being adherent. And then I got drug resistance, so the medicine stopped working and I had to be shifted or transitioned to a new regimen. These cured protected populations are also stigmatized and sometimes discriminated by the policy environment sometimes and the legal environment, but also but sometimes by our health workers. And then one health worker told me Actually, she was a pharmacist. She told me, you know, you are there, you're trying to brag about your nice skin, you wait until happy is hits it. I was like, why can't someone just understand that this is what I'm going through? Someone even told us that you cannot do a bachelor's degree because your mind or your brain cannot, has, doesn't have the capacity to contain a bachelor's degree. It has, it has the capacity of a certificate it has the capacity of a diploma, but not a bachelor's degree. And then at home, they're telling you, no, you cannot travel because maybe HIV cannot allow you to travel. And then you're asking them why, then they're like, you need to have confirmation from the doctor whether the wind, the airplane wind, cannot <laughs> affect you. And I mean, this relationship, this guy finds out about my status, but because I have friends who are male, and then he starts like sending them texts in disguise of an anonymous person. The stigma around relationships, around school, around you know home is too much. We want to make sure that we address this gap of stigma and discrimination because it hinders uh, and reduces the access of these populations to services. The most important thing is to give them the information, correct information, which you now have a lot what causes the disease, how it is spread, how it affects people who are infected, how to prevent it, and how to help people who are already infected like me. We, working with the Minister of Health and the other partners are trying to design specific messages, messages targeting young people, and also the methods of transmission, you know, through 
the platforms where they are most, using fellow young people either as peers uh, directly to carry this message or through acts by them, through you know things that are likely to attract their attention. So the design of the message has to change. The carrier of the message, it is important, but it's also very important to segment those population subgroups. I'm on the community advisory board of the um, African Community Partnership Treatment Access. So we do a lot of treatment, HIV treatment literacy, but I also do a lot of advocacy around um, young people living with HIV, adolescent girls and young women, sexual reproductive health and rights. Generally, I love <laughs> advocacy and I love working with community. The young people are the future of this country. They need to be alive and well for us to be able to industrialize. So if they are unwell, then we won't have the engineers, the teachers, and all the people that we need. So we, we have to put that message out for the young people, for them to know, to be aware of the dangers that uh, HIV may not be visible, as visible, but uh, it's still there. Adultery by either sex presents a danger to the other partner and ultimately to the whole family. If we don't work hard, the human race is going to die. We are not in a very bad place. Uh, first of all, we have about 1.4 million people, Ugandans estimated to be living with HIV out there. We've moved from a point of no provision in terms of uh, the technologies, and available remedies to a lot of hope now. We have not only efficacious antiviral therapy, you know, where more than 1.2 million people are accessing this treatment, but we, you know, also we have other products that are coming on the market. We have pre-exposure prophylaxis for those at risk. We have post-exposure prophylaxis for those who may have accidentally exposed themselves or those through either rape or defilement, but who, who proved to be HIV negative. I would also encourage people who are already infected to have hope. There is future. They can even marry or relate with HIV negative individuals, produce children if they want, and they will not infect them because we know an undetectable viral load is untransmittable. Right now, I am a mother of one child. He's HIV negative, and he's happy, he's very energetic. Right now, I'm a graduate. I'm a graduate with a bachelor's degree. I have traveled so many countries, I cannot even count. My advice to the youth, one, for those that are living with HIV is, let this not be like a death sentence. I mean, there is life to live. So what do you want the world to see you as? Do you want them to see you as a failure, as someone who is just living with HIV and then you have nowhere to go? Or do you want them to see you as someone who is living with HIV but you're positively living, you have a goal, you have a dream to achieve. If you have HIV, there is still hope, there is treatment, but you don't want to be on medication, you know, on a daily basis. There is ongoing research. We don't know when, but one day down the road we should be able to get a vaccine, we should be able to get a cure. You need to remain alive for those innovations once they come. Live a life that promotes health. Prevent disease. HIV can be prevented. There are many other diseases that can be prevented, including non-communicable diseases. If you are found to be HIV positive, please seek care and treatment. Do not treat yourself even if you are a doctor like me. This Time Up campaign is going to not only consolidate on the achievements that we have, we have made in some of the, the, the population, but also to address these gaps which we have identified both in prevention, but also in the 95, 95, 95 HIV testing, HIV treatment, and viral load suppression casket, which is a key strategy to achieving HIV epidemic control in Uganda, which is our major uh, uh, objective, and also ending AIDS as a public health challenge by 2030 in this country. Testing is the first step to end HIV. I am and you are the end to HIV. Time up HIV.